Hi, everybody. This is Lauren Baker, the founder of Search Engine Journal. Um, thank you for attending our SEJ webinar today. Today, we have a very special guest and partner, <laughs> Mr. Stephen Von Vessem of Content King. Stephen, I'll give you a chance to say hi real quick, and then I'll just do our intro uh, for all the guests. Cool. Sounds good. Thank you very much uh, for having me, Lauren. Absolutely. Welcome, everyone. Yes. Absolutely. So um, before Stephen gets started with this presentation today, which is very interesting. So uh, first of all, um, first of all, I uh, I know that either in-house or on the agency side, we've all dealt with surprises, quote unquote, uh, from time to time that uh, can pop up. Um, a lot of these issues could be, you know, someone just make deciding to make a change to a title tag, someone deciding to change the URL structure or do a migration when they haven't told you about it beforehand. And Stephen's going to go through a lot of those examples today. I think they're relevant to all of us um, and, and, and how to approach them and more so how to avoid them. Uh, so um, I think they're relevant to all of us from an in-house perspective or agency or consultancy perspective. So I'm really excited to go th uh, through Stephen's presentation and learn a lot uh, from that side and the Content King side as well. But before we get started, I just wanted to do some housekeeping. Um, first of all, uh, the presentation slash webinar is gonna last about 30 minutes. After that, we're going to be doing Q&A. However, as you have questions while Stephen's going through his slides in the webinar, please feel free to enter those questions into the question box on your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, we'll be sifting through those questions and I'll be utilizing them for the Q&A afterwards. Uh, so feel free to ask them as they pop up in your mind and uh, then we'll be uh, addressing them during the Q&A session itself. Uh, also, during, the, uh, during Stephen's presentation, we're going to be introducing a couple of different poll questions. I really encourage all of you to answer those poll questions. Not only does it give us a better idea of who you, the audience, is, but then also, uh, you know, Stephen can um, get a better idea of, of what you're facing from a day-to-day -day perspective uh, when he's putting together his, his presentation based upon a lot of your answers as well. So uh, please, please, please participate in the, the poll itself. And um, uh, really, that's about it. So uh, Stephen, I'm going to hand things over to you, let you get started, and um, cool. looking forward to your presentation. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Lauren. Thanks for the introduction. So yeah, welcome everyone. Today we're gonna to be talking about how to catch and fix SEO issues before it's too late. A Little bit about me, I'm the VP of community over at Content King. I've been doing SEO for about 13 years and I've been on all sides of the table. Worked in-house, agency side, and now vendor side. So Content King's been mentioned a couple of times. Um, what does the platform do? It's a real-time SEO auditing and content tracking platform that monitors sites 24-7 for issues and changes and alerts you in case of trouble. Why this topic? Why are we going to be talking about catching and fixing SEO issues? Um, it's, it's a bit of a hobby of mine to talk about SEO fails, SEO issues, and to really learn why they happen and how they could have been prevented. So search engines never sleep. They constantly crawl and update their index. And SEO mistakes happen anytime. You need to fix them before they impact your rankings and bottom line. And it's, it's possible. Did you know that 80% of the SEO issues go unnoticed for at least four weeks? And that the average SEO issue costs 75 thousand dollars in lost revenue that may sound as bad news but there is good news though with the right tooling and processes you can mitigate these issues so what about existing tools you ask doesn't search console does something along these lines sure they send out notifications but they are delayed and they're quite limited in scope and they're not as useful as you'd want them to be. And what about Google Analytics alerts? Well, when those alerts are triggered, your organic traffic has already taken a hit because 
that fact alone is part of the triggering mechanism. So during this presentation, we'll cover the most important and common SEO issues we come across and discuss how to prevent them from happening in the first place. First one up, a client or a colleague gone rogue. And this is a bit of a sucker punch because this one you do not see coming. The CMS was telling us to update it, so we did, including the theme and all of its plugins. Ah, and let me guess, you did that on the live environment? Hmm. We tweaked these page titles on the key pages all by ourselves. Hmm. So you mean those page titles that I spent hours optimizing? These pages didn't look important, so we deleted them. Hmm, yeah, those were our money pages. We didn't like the URLs on these pages, so we went ahead and changed them. Yeah, I've been trying to keep those URLs the same because we need to avoid URL migrations, even tiny ones. The competition is brutal, and my job, job is hard enough as it is. So this is all very frustrating, and it leads to your rankings taking it on the chin. So how do you prevent this? You need to keep track of whatever is going on on the site. You need to know what's up. And you need to receive alerts when someone goes rogue. <laughs> and trust me, they will. You need to limit access as much as possible. So for instance, why would a content marketer have access to functionality to update a CMS, right? And by setting clear rules of engagement, you make sure that everyone knows what they can and cannot do. So this change tracking thing, what does it look like? This is a screenshot from Content King, and it's basically showing you what pages were added, removed, redirected, changed, and so on. You have a full change log of whatever happened on your site from the moment we started monitoring the site. And you can just basically compare what the site was like, I don't know, uh, yesterday or a couple of days ago or a week ago, whatever you want. Uh, we'll pull up the diff and show you exactly what happened. So you can go in and see what happened, when it happened, and kind of trace back from there uh, to, to look for the, the cause of the issue. And because we're constantly monitoring sites, we can also audit it constantly. So we're continuously checking the site and running our full test suite to spot any issues we come across. And the alerts is where 24-7 monitoring, change tracking, and auditing come together. And of course, you only want to get alerts about issues and changes that matter to you. And alerts need to be smart. So for instance, do you want to receive an alert if the page title changes on some of the least important pages within your site? No, right? Okay. What about your home page? Yeah, for sure. And what about um, if the page title changes on like 80% of the least important pages? I would want to receive an alert like that because it could be the start of something much bigger, something I definitely want to keep an eye on. So. Other common SEO issues we're going to be covering during this presentation are development teams gone rogue, releases gone bad, and buggy CMS plugins. That's quite an exotic one. I think you'll like it. But first, it's time for a poll. Have you had important SEO issues go unnoticed? And please be honest, I won't judge. Absolutely. So it. I'm going to launch the poll now. Um, thank you for making this an easy one, Stephen. So yes <laughs> or no, have you ever had SEO, or I'm sorry, have you ever had important SEO issues go unnoticed? Uh, A, yes. B, no. Like I said, moving into this, we really, really, really like to get everybody uh, voting. And I see s almost 70% of you have already. This only takes nice. a second. 
So please go ahead. Our goal is to get at least above 80% and we're at 75 right now. So I'm gonna do a quick countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, this is your final chance. Final answer, closing the poll as we speak and sharing the results. So 87% of our audience says yes, they have had important SEO issues go unnoticed. And 13% say no, no. No uh, mm -hmm. SEO issues have gone unnoticed at all. So the vast majority have had this problem in the past. And back over to you. Thanks, Lauren. That, that's actually more than I thought. Wow. All right. Let's carry on and see if we can squash some of, some of those situations. The development team that's gone rogue is the next one up. In this case, the development team didn't include SEO specialists in selecting and testing a new pagination system for their e-commerce store. They went with, with uh, a pagination system that heavily relied on JavaScript and that caused big delays in the whole crawling and indexing process because all of these paginated pages had to go through the rendering process, which slowed it down significantly. And as you can imagine, because of this, it was much harder for search engines to discover and value new product pages, not to mention reevaluating existing product pages. Like what authority should they get if the whole pagination system is gone or not working correctly or not visible to search engines at some point. So this was one of those cases that could have easily been prevented by just involving SEO specialists early on to validate certain solutions. And the next one up is one that uh, I've I may or may not have been involved in some time myself. So uh, changes were approved for the English version of the site. And because they were hastily shipped across all language versions, the changes actually had a much bigger impact. And it caused quite the mess on the non-English, like the non-American uh, uh, section of, of the site. International SEO is hard enough as it is. It's easy to spot stuff like this. So you really need to hammer those, those processes and rules of engagement home when it comes to international SEO. How to prevent this? Again, track all changes. So as soon as something happens, you know about it. If you're responsible for the SEO performance of a site, you need to know exactly what's going on. And you need to be alerted in case someone goes rogue. And again, trust me, they will. These clear rules of engagement are vital. And you need to do proper QA testing. More on that later, stay with me. Release has gone bad. So is this just bad luck or could they have been prevented? Let's start with a classic. When doing a release, the staging robots text accidentally carried over to production and it had a disallow slash in it, which meant that no crawlers were given access to the site. So from one moment to the next, search engines did not have access to any of the URLs on the site, which is not great for SEO. Like if it happens for, I don't know, like an hour or whatever, the, the impact can still be limited. But as it drags on, you really get into trouble. And related to this, and uh, this, this may be one of the most common SEO issues, uh, it's basically where um, uh, MetaRobots uh, noindex tags are carried over from staging or acceptance environments over to production as well. And when you have that implemented through the X robots tag, with the HTTP header, uh, it's a lot harder to spot. So that's where it gets really interesting and proper monitoring systems uh, are really key. 
To battle unintended robots text changes, we developed a robots text change tracking system that basically pulls your robots text every five minutes looking for changes. In a case, uh, we detect changes, we send out an alert immediately, and you can quickly jump in to see if this was intended or not. And as you may know, with robots text, one character can make all the difference. So uh, it, it's really, really important to keep track of this. I also think that robots text directives are um, least uh, understood in SEO. There's very little SEOs I know that really know robots text from top to bottom. So while they seem easy, just a plain text file, they're quite tricky. In the next example, there was a new site section that was being released and it contained hard-coded canonicals to the development environment. And as soon as they were shipped to production, these hard-coded canonicals stayed in there and the development environment wasn't accessible through uh, for search engines because it had HTTP auth in front of it. So had search engines had a browser, uh, they would have gotten this pop-up, like filling your username and password. So none of the content on the development environment was accessible. And the digital marketing manager uh, was just basically wondering, like, when's this new section going to get indexed? After a couple of weeks, they found out that the canonicals were actually pointing from the production environment still to the development environment. So this is slightly related to the uh, example we just mentioned about robots text, meta, uh, meta robots no index. It's not very easy to spot and nobody goes digging through the HTML source of all of the pages that were newly released, uh, but it, it can have a massive impact uh, when stuff like this crops up. So how do you battle release has gone bad? By implementing an automated quality assurance testing during pre-release, release, and post-release. And I'm not just, not just talking about having a monitoring system in place like Content King, but you also need to have the right processes in place. Imagine this, um, uh, a release is gone bad. You notice that you missed something. You need to quickly revert the release, go back to the previous state to prevent search engines from quickly picking up on the issues that you just released to production. And at risk of sounding like a broken record, track all changes and get alerted when something goes wrong. So time for another poll. Are you also monitoring your staging or accepting uh, acceptance environment? Yes or no? Absolutely, Stephen. So another easy uh, answer for all of you out there. Uh, like you said, are you mo also monitoring your staging or acceptance environment? Yes or no? Please go ahead and uh, answer now. I love that uh, dev environment referring canonical example that you showed. <clears throat> That's happened to me numerous times in the past. Um, <laughs> And I've You're always brave, figured man. it out when the site has dropped off of page one. <laughs> and yeah. uh, then it's like, hey, exactly what happened? Um, oh, oh, we updated it. Boom. Um, also, uh, also the inclusion of the no index, uh, no follow tag as well uh, from mm -hmm. the dev environment to see that carry over as well as always a horror story. So uh, looks like 70% of you have voted already. I'm going to do my countdown right now. Five, four, mm -hmm. three, two, one. Let's go ahead, close the poll, share the results. 64% uh, of attendees do not monitor mm -hmm. their staging or acceptance environment, while 36% do. So 64% mm -hmm. do not, the vast majority, while 36% do. Hiding mm -hmm. the results and back to you, Stephen. Any thoughts gotcha. on that answer? It, it's interesting. I think, honestly, there's uh, quite some room for improvement there. Because <clears throat> if you catch these issues early on, before re releasing them to production, you can really minimize the amount of SEO 
issues and unexpected changes occurring in the production environment. But I I understand the poll results because it's not as easy as just monitoring a production environment. Uh, it takes a bit more uh, more work and uh, creativity to to yeah compare those staging or acceptance environments in the production environments. All right, next one up is buggy CMS plugins. They can be a real pain in the butt, and I'll explain why. Security updates are often forcibly applied, and when they contain bugs, these are introduced without your knowledge. Over the years, we've seen a bunch of examples where buggy CMS plugins changed SEO configurations of hundreds, thousands of sites in one update. And I'm pretty sure Search Engine Journal has covered uh, a couple as well. So if you're curious, uh, do some Googling, you'll find them. And it's stuff like this that catches everyone by surprise. But it just happens. Like we, we mentioned it before. It's like these SEO issues and changes, they just happen. And what really matters is how you deal with it. Like some things cannot be prevented from happening, but you got to take measures uh, uh, to, to, to minimize the impact of the changes. So you, you need to know what's going on so you can quickly jump in and apply fixes where, where necessary. So how do you make sure you're not affected by these buggy CMS plugins? Well, by disabling automatic updates and by tracking all changes, receiving those alerts when something goes wrong. So by now you must be run, wondering, how does traditional crawling measure up against continuous monitoring that I've been talking about? Let's take an example. Here, there's an SEO incident, and you've got weekly scheduled crawls set up to go on Monday. And when something goes wrong on Tuesday, you won't know about it until the next Monday. By then, search engines will have picked up on it. And with Content King, you would have already had the fix in place. Or what about the situation where you're crawling a large site, which takes maybe two, three days to finish? And by the time it does, you'll be looking at old data. In the meantime, all sorts of changes have already been made. Maybe even your robots text, your XML sitemaps have changed. So what you wanna do is when something breaks, you need to know immediately and fix it before Google notices it. That's our philosophy. And a right approach to do this is by assigning importance to URLs and then monitoring accordingly. So not all URLs are created equally. So for instance, your homepage and money page are much more important than say uh, some blog articles from a couple of years ago that do not drive any traffic. And you want your homepage and your money pages to be checked more frequently. So what we do is we crawl the most important pages uh, most often. And we report what we find and we recheck those special URLs as we're monitoring to see whether uh, we've detected any changes in the robots text file uh, and how that influences the issues we found uh, we find in the site so it's um, when you look at monitoring your SEO performance in your site you need to think of it as a uh, like a, a a fluid process where um, uh, the importance of URLs uh, may change as well as you're adjusting your internal link structure, <clears throat> meaning your tooling should adjust at that very moment as well. So you maybe you're thinking right now, it's like, okay, but can't you just uh, increase monitoring uh, capacity like tenfold and then be done with it? Well. Not really, because you have to be smart about using that available bandwidth. Just like search engines assign crawl budget to a site, uh, Content King assigns crawl budget to a site. 
there is an upper limit to the number of requests a site can handle. Therefore, you need to be smart about checking URLs and rechecking them. <clears throat> you need to rely on heuristics to make the most of it. For instance, um, look at heuristics as hints. If a page in section A of the site changes, it's likely that pages in that same section also change. Or if a page that's very much related uh, to other pages changes, it's very likely that those other pages also changed. So based on hints like these, you can make your, your whole monitoring process more intelligent. And at the end of the day, it, it means that you've got more, more information uh, and it comes in much quicker. So quick recap of what we've discussed so far to battle these SEO issues and quickly fix them. Give only need to have access. Set clear rules of engagement. Use 24 seven monitoring with continuous auditing and change tracking and receive those alerts when something goes wrong. And remember, 80% of these SEO issues go unnoticed for at least four weeks. And the average SEO issue costs $75,000, US dollars, by the way, in lost revenue. The question isn't if something will go wrong. The question is when. Are you ready? Don't leave your bottom line unprotected. Thank you very much for your attention. You can find us at contentgangapp.com. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer anything. Over to you, Lauren. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Stephen. Uh, incredible information there. And the thing that really, um, that really hit me, and it was the impactful data around the 80% uh, percent of mm. issues did not get fixed for four weeks. And then the monetary loss data as well on the average of $75,000 uh, being what's lost from um, these issues. So yeah. um, I would see that being a, a way, so one of the challenges that SEOs have uh, and I got some of these uh, questions coming in about this, is mm -hmm. the ability to set those parameters for the development team, right? And some of the hurdles mm -hmm. you may have, especially, we know that most of the, um, a lot of the day-to-day -day from an in-house perspective is building relationships with developers and, and getting in that timeline and this and that. But from an agency or consultancy perspective, that can be kind of hard. Um, mm -hmm. Now, this this slide and this data really impacted me. Would you say it would be something that, in addition to putting together a case study like this to really get that conversation going internally, are there any other data points that you would recommend or any ways for consultants or agencies that you would recommend to be able to get this conversation started if someone's already working with a site where they do not have mm -hmm. either a relationship built or in some cases the trust of the development team are there any ways that you would recommend to get this conversation started yeah so first of all the relationships with development teams are vital to getting stuff done uh, as an seo uh, and having information like this really helps you to make your case. So the way I've always approached um, working together with development teams is uh, to provide them with all of the, the resources and day-to-day uh, -day needs uh, and back up as much as you can. Uh, and like if they're, I don't know, if they're working on hreflang, uh, they'll want to know like, how does it work? What are the best practices? Uh, what are uh, the some of the downsides? How do I use it? Are there certain edge cases to take into consideration? Uh, and are there similar um, uh, examples, uh, examples of sites that, uh, that have rolled out uh, similar setups, et cetera, et cetera. So if you gather 
uh, information and data about that that really helps you make your case internally. Is that an answer gotcha. to your question, Lauren? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. So, in addition to if uh, if maybe an issue has not happened yet, uh, and building an internal case study around potential losses uh, from issues on that side, looking to see what the competitors have done, how they've rolled it out, exactly. how they've rolled out yeah. something right versus wrong, right? Yeah. Um, and then maybe also there, you know, there's a number of tools out there that uh, give an expected value of traffic right yes. so if you see that a competitor yep. has lost maybe 50 percent on what mm. you can see is an obvious yeah. flaw right that they're not seeing you say hey look uh when this happened to so and so they lost x percent of their traffic possibly they're using losing x percent of revenue let's not fall into this same hole when we're doing our release or our migration or whatever exactly. in the timeline right mm -hmm. um yeah. And if you can't find any competitors, uh, then yeah, going more generic will do. Um, like uh, uh, I think it was two months ago, we uh, wrote an article about um, the biggest SEO fails we've come across in 2020. And we covered stuff like uh, what happened at LinkedIn and Ryanair and uh, uh, a couple of other examples. Like there's plenty of information out there. You just need to know where to look. Uh, and yeah, I would use anything uh, uh, I, I can get my hands on to make my case. Also, uh, one one piece of advice uh, I'd like to give any uh, agency or, or consultant out there is that you should not be having this conversation with the developers after you sign the contract. <laughs> you should mm -hmm. be finding this <laughs> out before signing the contract. Uh, so. Yeah. Uh, during uh, your um, uh, introduction phase, during the RFP phase, during mm -hmm. whatever phase it is that you're going down, the ability to work with the development team or have a liaison between whether you're working with a project manager, a product manager, or an, an internal uh, uh, VP of digital or whatever it may be, their ability to have a relationship with the development team to actually get things done that you're presenting mm -hmm. should be something yeah. that you address before signing that contract. Uh, because yeah. if not, you could very well be setting yourself up for long-term failure mm -hmm. on exactly. that yeah. behalf. Uh, one yeah. question that came in, you're discussing plugins and things like that. So uh, from your experience, which CMS systems have presented the most issues with SEO? Uh, both, <laughs> let's say, let's start with uh, publishing CMS solutions and then e-commerce based platforms as well. Uh, which mm -hmm. of each have you found uh, introduce the most issues from an SEO perspective? Um, uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. And um, like from a publisher point of view, uh, it would have to be WordPress. Um, uh, of course, WordPress has a huge user base. So there's millions and millions of sites running on, on WordPress. Um, and there's a ton of plugins out there and People are quite keen to try them out and leave them installed, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so all sorts of stuff happens. Uh, we covered um, like honest mistakes, uh, like buggy updates that were pushed. Uh, but imagine um, WordPress plugins uh, being sold uh, to some other party, and someone injects some code and takes over your site. Like it happens, um, and it doesn't mean you shouldn't use WordPress. You just need to be mindful of what you know, could happen. Uh, and if we're talking e-commerce, uh, I would say Magento um, uh, as one of the most popular platforms out there um, uh, with a, a ton of extensions as well. Um, it, it can be quite tricky to, uh, to keep everything running um, if you don't keep uh, like your Magento version um, up to date, uh, as well as the extensions. And especially now uh, that Magento 1, for instance, has been discontinued, um, uh, at least by uh, development by Adobe, uh, it's, it's quite tricky to, to keep everything running and safe.
Excellent. So you brought up a, a couple of really good points uh, that I like to recap, especially on the WordPress side. Um, we like to play with plugins, right? Hey, Don't we all? this new plugin just launched. Hey, this new plugin just launched. Let me install it, see what happens. So uh, maybe setting up a calendar where you're doing like a plugin purge mm -hmm. on a quarterly basis, possibly even a 30-day basis, I don't know, but a quarterly basis sounds like a good uh, recommendation there for a number of reasons. One, some mm -hmm. of these plugins, as you said, uh, maybe the owner has moved on to something else, right? Maybe they they aren't, either they're not updating it on a regular basis, so you run into security issues, which happen there, yeah. right? They're not updating it yeah. as WordPress updates. Um, or there's also plugin conflicts that can happen. One plugin mm -hmm. is saying to yeah. make this uh, canonical this, one plugin is saying, you know what, we're going to add another canonical tag later on in your code, mm -hmm. and we're going to introduce yeah. both of those to Google. Or we're going to use a command called a no index for this uh, component of the code, which Google is going to recognize as a command that says, take this site out of our index, right? So there, mm -hmm. there's that issue from a, a plugin conflict perspective and yeah. outdated plugins. And you also touched upon yeah this kind of black hat marketplace of expired plugins, which does exist. Mm -hmm. So yep. sometimes sure people does. will sell plugins. They'll sell them the companies that may say, hey, we're going to sell links <laughs> within yeah. our plugin code on the sites that run our plugins. But they don't tell yeah. you that as the owner of the site. So suddenly your site may be secretly linking out to multiple different, you know, uh, pharmaceutical oriented sites or, or other types of sites <laughs> that are associated, Lawrence. yeah, <laughs> uh, pharmaceutical, physical enhancement sites that are associated, yeah. uh, that are not necessarily associated with what you do, right? So that's something that you should really check yeah. into as well. Um, are For your sure. plugins updated? Um, mm -hmm. Are they useful? Are they conflicting? Um, are they yeah. still owned by the same company that launched them? Uh, mm -hmm. So that's a really good one. And also be on top of plugin updates as they happen, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Especially some of the SEO plugins out there. Yeah, uh, Lauren, I've got one addition uh, to um, like the uh, the topic of uh, conflicts. Um, with the adoption of uh, CDNs like Cloudflare, um, uh, the, the, you basically add a whole extra layer of potential complexity uh, because you can run redirects on Cloudflare. You can uh, basically yep. make changes to code on Cloudflare. So when you're talking conflicts, you need to uh, basically yeah, broaden your usual scope of looking at the site. Uh, and when you're diagnosing issues, you need to take into account the full architecture of the site. Because nowadays we're seeing a ton of stuff happening uh, on CDNs, and people are basically digging through their WordPress install or some other platform, and they're like, "Hey, I, I don't see these uh, redirects. Where are they managed? I don't pick up on these uh, uh, matter robots no index tags, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Uh, and as it turns out, uh, uh, some of those may be running uh, on a CDN. So uh, it can, like, I'm a big proponent of CDNs. They uh, add massive amounts of value. Uh, but when you're making changes in CDNs, uh, uh, you need to adjust your processes as well. You need to make your team aware of what's going on and how your architecture is set up. I'm glad you brought that up. Um... I've uh, dealt with this a little bit uh, earlier in the year. So especially uh, when the CDN is used as an alternative for what not can be what cannot be done on the platform, one really good example yeah. is uh, Shopify, right? And utilizing yep. Cloudflare workers as a workaround to the limitations mm -hmm. that Shopify has uh, with uh, you know uh, robots.txt, other types of edits mm -hmm. that are that are just typically not allowed within their system, right? So if all of that's done within Cloudflare and then suddenly Cloudflare is off, uh, someone makes a decision, hey, we're going to change uh, CDNs from Cloudflare to AWS. 
whoa, wait mm -hmm. a second. Well, let's make sure <laughs> everything yeah, that move we've over done configuration. to yeah. solidify our current ranking in Google that was done on the front end yeah. of, or that was done on the Cloudflare CDN yeah. side is moved yeah. over as well. So that, that's a very good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Sure, yeah. Uh, one thing about Shopify's robots text uh, control, um, Jackson from Shopify uh, tweeted about this a couple of weeks ago, asking for uh, use cases where um, you'd like to get that robots text control. Uh, so maybe they're thinking about uh, adding control features for that from within the admin environment. Uh, but I think SEOs have made their point where uh, they basically say, hey, this could be really useful uh, uh, functionality for us. So if anyone on the webinar has any good ideas, look up Jackson from Spotify, uh, uh, Shopify uh, on Twitter um, and um, look up his tweet. Uh, send all your use cases there because uh, I think it'll be a good thing for more advanced SEOs to get that control. Yeah, and I also did notice that Shopify is hiring in their SEO departments as well. Yeah. So I wonder if they're they're uh, looking to get more uh, integrated on that side as well. Um, while we're on the subject of plugins, uh, I did have a question come in that's uh, quite direct. Um, does it really help you to use two plugins for SEO? Say, can you run Yoast and Rank Math at the same time? Well, you, you can, but it doesn't mean you should. I would never, ever use two plugins to basically do the same job. Uh, so, no. The chances of having conflicts in your code is too high because the plugins work differently, but they both have an effect on stuff like um, uh, robots tags, canonicals, XML sitemaps, robots texts. So, like, all bets are off if you install multiple SEO plugins. And when you're encountering SEO issues, where are you even gonna start with debugging? So I wouldn't go there, um, no. Okay, good. <laughs> and, yeah, and Rank Math is not sponsoring a Dutch basketball team, um, but, but Yoast is, so that's, that's another <laughs> the way they don't uh, match up. So um, you, you were using examples of uh, the the um, kind of the the vagueness uh, and the uncertainty and the uh, the time it takes to get an alert from Google Search Console mm -hmm. when there are issues, right? So a, a lot of uh, Google Search Console mentions uh, in your presentation led to a lot of questions around mm -hmm. um, core vitals and mm -hmm. page speed insights. Um, how important and what are your thoughts on the new Core Web Vitals from Google? Um, are alerts that are uh, similar to Core Web Vitals part of the Content King experience? And um, I, I know Google has said that they're not necessarily a huge part of the ranking algorithm mm -hmm. yet, but yeah. Yeah. where do you see this going from your experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great questions. So first of all, um, when you look at uh, uh, the Core Web Vitals uh, and PageSpeed, uh, it all comes down to providing visitors with a solid user experience. Uh, so not just um, serving a site quickly, uh, but also making sure the whole user experience is, is correct uh, and seamless. Uh, so I think it's important uh, I think it's very important from a, a conversion uh, point of view as well. Uh, when looking at it from an SEO point of view, I think that the impact of having, uh, having issues is quite limited. Um, if you uh, were to uh, ask me, like Steve, um, does uh, having a poor page experience, for instance, um, have a direct impact on your rankings? I would say no. Not at all to maybe tiny pie, um, but the indirect impact is much bigger. Like if you're consistently um, uh, providing a poor user experience, at some point people are going to say, mm, I'm not going to go to your site anymore because your competitor uh, is providing a much better user experience uh, and well, bye bye. 
So over time, it, it, of course, it has an issue, uh, uh, ha has an effect, uh, and it could impact stuff like uh, click-through rates, et cetera, et cetera, which I think is an indirect signal, which works down to your rankings as well. So uh, of course, at the end of the day, you wanna give people a good user experience, uh, page experience is important. Core web vital scores are important. Having uh, a good page speed scores is important. Um, but uh, right now, it's uh, it's still uh, a small factor from an SEO point of view. From a digital marketing point of view, it's a, a big thing, of course. Uh, and to answer the second part of the question, uh, to what extent does Content King currently uh, report on this and alert on this? Uh, we report uh, page load times, uh, and you can create segments. Uh, for instance, um, uh, a segment uh, uh, that you create around pages that take, I don't know, uh, maybe uh, one second or longer uh, to load. And based on that segment, you can set up alerts. Um, and you can uh, say, I want to receive alert if uh, pages enter this segment. And as we're continuously checking uh, the site and registering those low time responses. Uh, we'll quickly send out alerts for that. So I hope that answers uh, the question. Of course, if anyone um, has uh, uh, feature requests, we'd be happy to take a look. To a large degree, our development roadmap is determined based on uh, our customer input. So um, happy to uh, look at feature requests for sure. And, you know, uh, kind of going back to the original uh, topic that we were talking about with the data and the stats and the case studies, one thing you just brought up is conversion and customer yeah. experience, right? So um, this I found to be very useful with making SEO cases is that now um, things like visual stability and load time are tracked as errors within Search Console, right? So mm -hmm. if I can go back to um, who I'm reporting to and say, look, you currently have errors on the site that are being mm -hmm. reported by Google. These errors can affect SEO, but we also know that the fact that when I go to your product page, and on a mobile device and it starts moving around and I can't mm -hmm. find the buy now button anymore. That's a yeah. visual stability error. That's part of the cumulative uh, layout shift, the CLS, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Let's get this fixed. Why? Not only is Google reporting this as an error, which can impact SEO, but mm -hmm. this is 100% related to conversions. For and sure. sales yeah. and numbers. Mm -hmm. So let's get this fixed because it's not just going to lead to getting more SEO and search intent oriented traffic, but it's going to immediately lead to more money coming in and more sales exactly. and revenue coming in, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing yeah. with load time. I think it's Cloudflare. I'll, I'll share the graph afterwards, but Cloudflare has a really interesting case study that they did with load time and conversion rate. And they can, it easily illustrates visibly the mm -hmm. higher conversion rate attributed to a quicker load time. Why? Because yeah. now the majority of traffic uh, coming from mobile, comes from mobile devices. I have e-commerce mm -hmm. clients that 85% of their traffic right now comes from a mobile device. And 75% of that mobile traffic comes from Apple. Safari, mm -hmm. which is amazing, right? Yeah. So suddenly Safari yeah. is a new contender in the browser <laughs> market again. So mm -hmm. having that, yeah. ha having all of that, even SEJ right now, we were going through the SEJ numbers earlier today. Over the course of the year, our mobile traffic has grown from in the 20% to the 40%, which is amazing. Wow. Like for a mm -hmm. B2B publication, I was not expecting yeah. to see that number at all. And then no. we just had a meeting this morning about that. So really a lot of the core vital, core web vital numbers that you're seeing enhance mobile interaction with you either from a, a, if you're a B2C or a B2B. So 
definitely is something mm -hmm. that you want to address. And again, it yeah. helps to bring the conversation away from we're going to go from ranking on page for our, from position three to position yeah. two. So you know what? Let's convert all of the traffic, all of the traffic that you're getting right now, mm -hmm. um, not just uh, not just the search traffic um, that you're getting. So so thanks thanks for going yeah. over that. I found it to yeah, be really right. cool. that's a, that's a really good point. Uh, so from conversion point of view, it's it's massive, uh, and you need to look at this like from a, a holistic point of view. It's like at the mm -hmm. end of the day, what kind of user experience are you providing? And are you worthy of the clicks from Google? Um, and it, the whole picture needs to be perfect, ideally. And it's um, even though something may not be a ranking factor right now, um, it pays off to just keep a close eye on it and continuously keep improving your site. It's like people were improving their, their site speed 10 years ago. Uh, like in competitive yeah. niches, niches, it makes all the difference. So, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Good point. Um, and then, you know, another thing that Google rolled out not too long ago was also the uh, the organic component of Google Shopping, right? Mm -hmm. Which is based upon yep. not only what you're providing in your Google Merchant Center feeds, but also your your on-page experience. So getting ready for that is is, is pretty big as, as well. Um, Stephen, I also had a lot of questions coming in uh, around uh, really understanding crawl budget. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, could you, would you mind kind of going over again what crawl budget is and mm -hmm. what are the main factors that not only Google uh, looks at with when determining which pages of the site to crawl on an ongoing basis, but also what you all look at as well? Would you mind just mm -hmm. going over that quickly one yeah. more time again? Yes. So uh, when we're talking about crawl budget, we're basically talking about the attention your site is getting from Google in terms of crawling. Like how frequently do they visit your site? Um, uh, for instance, if you have a shaky hosting setup and your server doesn't handle that load from Google that well, um, Google will throttle uh, requests and they will say, hmm, maybe this platform can't handle the usual load. Let's um, uh, cut it in two uh, and and do just 50% uh, of the the request we normally do, um, and vice versa. If the platform is really really fast and Google's noticing, hmm, yeah, the platform can handle a lot. Um, there's no limitations there really, um, and if they deem your site worthy of more crawling. So for instance, if you're uh, publishing a lot of uh, good content and you're winning a lot of links from other sites to yours, uh, you're basically building up that authority. And, and, and yeah, having that authority and having that uh, solid uh, uh, server performance basically um, makes up for an ideal uh, a crawl budget situation basically where Google is saying hey I'm just gonna crawl you uh, all day and um, yeah they'll be able to quickly pick up uh, any new content or adjusted content uh, so that's how Google and other search engine uh, search engines in general deal with it uh, the way content King deals with it is actually quite similar uh, so um, yeah you have a site with the next amount of pages and based on a variety of signals, we determine the importance of a URL. Uh, so stuff like uh, is a, a page linked from the home page uh, and the uh, click depth. Uh, in the, the way the internal link structure is set up, uh, the, the content uh, change frequency. Um, and if you have Google uh, Analytics and Google Search Console connected, we'll pull in that data as well. And we'll basically work, run the numbers uh, and come up with the important score. And we use that as one of the main ways uh, to drive the, uh, the, the monitoring cycle, basically. And as we're monitoring, we keep a watchful eye on the service performance. So if we see that something's up, 
we immediately slow down monitoring. So for instance, if you, uh, I don't know, run backups at 4 a.m. in the morning and you uh, your your server is uh, uh, has limited resources at that point to handle these requests, we'll notice immediately and throttle down. And then after, say, five to 10 minutes, we'll uh, try to do a couple of uh, requests again to see if the server can handle it. And if it does, we'll try to work our way back to the usual monitoring cycle that we were on. So this is basically our uh, approach. Excellent. And uh, one thing that you touched upon in the beginning was, uh, you know, whether or not the, the, the hosting platform communicates well with Google mm -hmm. and the Google crawl. Uh, there was a uh, theory that Google, uh, John Mueller from Google recently debunked that shared hosting platforms uh, were, were not useful um, for SEO, uh, actually hurt your site. That was recently debunked by John Mueller at Google. It, it is not a negative impact uh, to have shared hosting. However, however, mm -hmm. there are a lot of cheap hosting platforms out there which will throttle traffic, which will uh, block mm -hmm. uh, crawls because they're trying to save their own internal budget on exactly. that side. So if you're determining yeah. uh, which hosting platform to utilize, make sure they're not gonna throttle your traffic because uh, that's the last thing you want at the end of the day is to get less traffic and or uh, for that to be an issue with Google at the end of the day. Um, a, a, another way to uh, make sure that um, you're, uh, you're serving Google exactly what they need um, uh, to better help that crawl budget is to do things like avoiding uh, accessible 301 redirects on the site, things like that, sending Google mm -hmm. down loops and holes, which they don't need to do. Yeah. Uh, one thing okay. I've heard a lot about, which I necessarily have not um, been able to implement myself, and let me know if you have an experience here, mm -hmm. is that the 404 error versus the 410 error. My mm -hmm. understanding is that the 404 is a can be a temporary error that Google will continuously revisit that page over time mm -hmm. to see if the page is back up again. But the 410 is an intentional error where the page has been intentionally taken down. And then once yeah. Google sees that uh, response, they, they will not revisit that, that URL again. Is that something you have experience with and does that help from a crawl budget perspective? Uh, yes uh, and yes. like. If you um, serve an HTTP status code 410, uh, it, it's a very clear signal like this URL does not exist anymore. Please stop crawling. Um, and it quickly uh, propagates into Google systems and they'll, they'll quickly stop crawling. Whereas the 404 is basically, it's still too often used as a like a default fallback in case of issues where a 404 is served. Um, well, actually, it, it should have been something else, like, I don't know, uh, 503, uh, service unavailable. Um, so Google's quite forgiving when it comes to 404s, but if they consistently hit those 404s, um, uh, like at some point, they're going to say, um, I'm just going to stop crawling this at the usual rate. Having said that, um, Google's got a great memory. Uh, so if you look in your server logs, you may find Google making requests um, requests to these old 404 URLs, like uh, a year after they started 404ing or whatever. So it's uh, there. It's quite an interesting discussion. Uh, 404s versus 410s. Interesting. So maybe we'll get into that deeper uh, in a future post or something like that. That might be a good. Uh... That might be a good overview for a standalone yeah. article in SEJ or something along those lines. I still have to come um, up with a, a topic for my next one. <laughs> there you go. Maybe I just threw you one. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> um, so we have like a minute left, but uh, in addition to uh, 404 errors on say on page 301 or accessible 301s through navigation and stuff like that, what are the, the three largest errors that you typically see at Content King with your audits that we should be on the lookout for? Mm -hmm. um, 
a lot of people set up robust text files incorrectly. Uh, so they um, uh, disallow certain sections uh, or perhaps their assets like CSS files, JS files. And if they're not accessible to Google, Google can't properly render your pages, uh, which means they can't really value them that well. Um, poor internal link structure uh, is another one. It's like uh, it, um, they may have pages with uh, just a handful of internal links and they're wondering like, uh, why does this page not rank? Well, there's a wealth of internal links to add. Um, and there is a lot of duplicate content insights in general as well. It's like duplicate page titles, headings, meta descriptions, et cetera, et cetera, where you're basically making it harder for Google to really understand what your content is about and which uh, content is actually the canonical version, the version that they should be crawling and indexing and focusing their their crawl budget on basically. Excellent, thank you, thank you. So we have uh, those three errors, uh, which we which uh, Stephen has seen the most, and you should be looking out for. Just Can to I remind, one, oh yes, one more. Let's number do it. four. Broken links. Oh yeah, like every site has them, and like links are continuously breaking. So uh, they, they, yeah, they, it, it, it's part of the top four for sure. Got you. Got you. Um, so that's, that's uh, broken links, uh, duplicate content, which can really mm -hmm. mess things up from a, a canonical perspective. And I'm sorry, what were the first two again? Uh, so robots text mm -hmm. uh, issues and internal link structure issues. Okay, got you, got you. Yeah. So um, we'll be including all of this and all of the discussion that we've had today, the presentation, uh, Stephen's presentation, along with the Q&A session in our uh, wrap up on SEJ. And just as a reminder, we will be sending out video of today's webinar to all registrants and all attendees, uh, along with a wrap up and I believe your deck as well, Stephen. Um, mm -hmm. Our next uh, webinar on SEJ is gonna be on October 14th. Uh, we'll be hosting PureLink on how a case study on how they built over 600 links in 30 days and how you can too. That's gonna to be uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, weeks on SEJ on October 14th over from PureLink. Uh, before we sign off, uh, Stephen, looks like we're a little bit over the hour right now. Was there anything, uh, any reminder, any call to action that our, uh, that our audience who's still sticking around should take right now to get in touch with you, follow you online? I know you're very active on Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. yep. any call out before we end things? I'd say, um, if you're serious about SEO and you want to know exactly what's going on on your site, I would definitely take content game for a spin. Uh, we've got a 14 day free trial. Uh, so, uh, yep. You could just set it up yourself on our site, drop in your domain, uh, and yeah, off you go. Great. And that's at contentkingapp.com. Yes, correct. Contentkingapp.com. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks for the, there we go, contentkingapp.com. So try the free trial. Thank you so much, Stephen. It's been a pleasure. I know it's pretty late there in the Netherlands right now, but we uh, definitely appreciate uh, you sticking around. <laughs> and uh, doing yeah. this, this time. It's been a pleasure uh, doing this. Thanks for having yeah. me. Yeah, thanks for the 140 of you or so that are still sticking around right now. So that's uh, that's great to see. And we're going to have a large recap. Um, looking forward to seeing that on SEJ and uh, possibly hosting you again, Stephen. It's been a pleasure uh, to everyone that's still there. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we'll be answering any additional questions that we didn't get answered and also sending that out with the recap. And we'll see you on the next SEJ Great. webinar. Thanks again, Stephen. Appreciate your time. And uh, yes. talk to you soon. Cool. Happy to. All right. Thank you very much, Lauren. Thank you. Signing off. off.